Hello and welcome to a Motor Week Motor Show Special. Now already this year we've shown you the highlights from the Geneva and Barcelona Motor Shows and today it's the turn of the Birmingham NEC for a motor show with a bit of a difference. Because this is Max Power Live, the loudest and most in-your-face car show around with the NEC packed with customised cars from all over Europe. And on this week's Motor Week we're giving you an insight into the loud, proud world of car modifying. Well, I don't know about you lot, but I think for this sort of motor show, I'm a bit overdressed. Time for a change. Ah, that's a bit more like it, I think. Now, for most regular Motor Week viewers, the idea of a modified car scene, well, you get images of spotty lads driving Novas with 15 speakers on the back parcel shelf. But no, you come to a show like this and it really opens your eyes just how much time, effort and money are spent in creating these masterpieces. There was nearly every make of car at the NEC that had had the modifying process and the first to catch our eye was some very tasty Peugeots in the corner. And they had the modifying treatment by Scottish company Ecos. So here we are sat in a modified 206cc. Now Dan, before we actually talk about the, the car, your company which, which specialises in modifying Peugeots, first of all, how, how do you keep going? I mean, is there a market for such, such a big market for these cars? There definitely is. I mean, we have spotted a niche market where people with Peugeots want something very special, very different. They don't want to be just another car in the crowd. They want to stand out. Now, looking around the, the show here, the, uh, there's a lot of young lads who, I mean, I, I'm sure I'd love to be able to afford a car like this, but uh, <laughs> I've struggled. So who are your customers who actually buy them? Well, I think uh, it is the young lads. I mean, certainly we do have a range uh, of customer ages, uh, anything from 17 to, I mean, we've got a customer at 65. So I don't think we can really pigeonhole everybody who likes to modify. Uh, but I would say that, unfortunately, the boy racer market is probably the, the, the most, uh, how can I say, uh, the most expendable cash. So, yes, I think it, it is mostly the younger uh, people that are doing it. But there is no age on modifying. So back to the car we're sat in at the 206cc now. It's one we featured on the, on the Motor Week programme. Um, and you can tell from the other side of the show that it looks, it looks a little bit different. But where do you start when, you, when you're looking at modifying a car? For me personally, I mean everyone likes something different. But me personally, I do like the car to look to the park to start with. Um, but um, I like speed. And I enjoy a car to be powerful. So I work on the engine next. Um, I have throttle bodies for this car, which are basically take up to 190 brake wow. uh, from 137 brake standard. So they're my two main things. And then after that, it's interior, and then going for the, the in-car entertainment. Now, presumably, if you're changing the engine power from 130 up to 190 brake, you're going to have to do some changes to suspension and brakes to be safe. Well, certainly, brakes and suspension, yeah, they're very important when you want to go a lot faster. Uh, we can do all that. We do four-pot brakes, we do six-pot brakes, we can do fancy suspension. We can do anything, really, to make it handle better once you've got that power. So, from one brand new modified Peugeot to one not so new. I've got a question for you. You can go out tomorrow, spend 17 grand on a brand new 206cc, or you can spend a grand on a 205 GTI and then another 16 grand doing it up. Now, it sounds madness, but Carl, that's exactly what you did, isn't it? It is. With your car. First question, what on earth possessed you to spend that much money? Well, well I know it's just an hobby, really. You know, it's a lot of time spent on it. You spend a lot of time doing it up. And there isn't one about it around, is it? So it's, you know, it's the fact that it's unique, yeah, is that what you're going for? it's mine. You won't find another one like it around, you know, so why not? Right, and this, this guy is now about 11 years old? Yeah, 11 years, 1990. So what, just quickly take me through what you've, what you've done to it. Uh, so, so everything's been changed, all underneath the car, all in the engine bays, all been renewed, polished up, signs, new hoses, everything's been renewed, new seats, Door cards, wheels, everything. Why not? It's brand new. You know, you won't get one around it. Like if we go get a new 206, everyone's got one, haven't they? Right. Yeah. Fair, fair point. Fair There's point. No one's got one of these. If you had it all over again, and I said, "Here you go, Carl, 17 grand," would you start from scratch? Or I mean, there must yeah. be new cars out there that you've seen that you think are quite like the look I of it. I thought about it. I thought about like, you know, buying a Beam or a Nord Cruiser 206, like it seems to say, but. I like the car, and I'll never get rid of this. Another question that people have asked me, and it seems quite surprising, we've got some really nice cars, people spend a lot of money on them, but they all seem so young. 
<laughs> now maybe it's just because I'm getting too old. <laughs> but I mean, what, what if you don't want me asking what you do for a living? Join it. Right. So you, you basically modify it in stages? Yeah, I have done, yeah. Um, I mean, some people like doing it from a bare shell and do it that way. But well, I've had a car and I was driving it at one point and then I just started adding bits onto it. But then I got a bit more into it and then I only use it for shows now and then just modify it that way. So it's, it's not your regular everyday no, transport? No, I've got another car to work in the back and messing around in. But this is just really for shows. And do you, do you think it's, it's age related? I mean, can you see yourself in a. You know, when you've, when you've got a wife and kids and all that, you're still going to have one of these sort of cars in the garage. Yeah, if you can afford it. You know, it's a bit of an hobby. If you haven't got an hobby, what else are you going to do? Now, it seems to me that every make of car gets picked for the modifying treatment, be it Ford, Vauxhall, VW, BMW, even Mazda. But one brand that does seem to be absent is Alfa. But many are saying that next year that's going to change because the Alfa 147 could be the next cult hot hatch. If I was in a pub arguing with you about the all-time great hot hatches, it's hardly likely that the name Alfa Romeo would come up. Granted, they've made some fantastic cars, but they're nowhere near the cult status of the likes of Golf GTIs and Ford RS models. But the people in the know are saying that the latest Alfa, the 147, is destined for great things in the hot hatch world, following in the footsteps of the current hot hatch king, the Citroen Saxo. Now that's a tall order, if ever there was one. Over the last few years, Alfa have managed to get rid of that build quality that was best suited to a Hong Kong Christmas cracker, an electrics that could have had their own Wiring From Hell series. Now they've got the quality and reliability of the best of Europe, yet they still remain an individual and passionate car. Now being a hot-blooded Italian company, Alfa like to do things differently and when it comes to interiors, this is a good thing. Style is the key word here. Looking more like a plain cockpit than a car interior, Alfa have really gone to town to make this car feel special. Compare this to a Golf or a Seat and, well, there's no comparison. In general terms, where Alpha will score points over the competition is with their Latin design flair. There's no mistaking this 147 for a Golf, Beamer or indeed anything else on the road. And it's that identity that any cult car needs, be it a Mark I Golf GTI, Citroen Saxo or Alfa Romeo. Now the problem with most of today's hot hatches is that they're much bigger and heavier than the steeds of old and this Alpha is no exception. It feels like you're driving a much larger car than you actually are. That's not saying that the ride is bad because it actually feels quite sporty. It's just not one of those cars that you'd want to chuck into corners go-kart style. -y. If the ride is a little subtle for your taste, you'll love playing with the gears on this car as it's fitted with cellar speed. That's paddle change to you and me. Just like Formula One, you can keep your foot in and paddle away to your heart's content. Tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be... Michael Schumacher! Though maybe not quite smooth enough for a racing car, the change is as smooth as any of the semi-automatic gearboxes we've tested and it's a doddle to use. Press right to change up and left to change down. Or you can use the floor-mounted gear stick if you're feeling sensible. The 2-litre engine in the cellar speed pulls really well once it's up and revving. And the all-important 0-60 time is a mild 9.3 seconds. But that's still quicker than a Saxo VTR and the Golf GTI 2-litre. Bellissimo! 
Handling and performance aside, one thing that Alpha get right every time over their rivals is the engine note. The 1.6 we've been driving around sounds brilliant, and when you rev this two litre hard, absolute perfection. No need for any big four exhaust conversions here. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that from a sporting aspect, the 147 knocks a 2-litre Golf GTI for six. But there's a big issue of price. At 17 grand, the Alpha is not cheap. And where the previous all-time great hot hatches have shone is with cheap, no-frills performance. So, Maybe the Alpha 147 is a little bit too grown up and luxurious for the top 10 of pocket rockets, but as an individual passionate car, it's fantastic. And for all of you who think that Alpha have got the wrong image to be in the boy racer market, well, if Citroen can do it, I don't think Alpha will have much bother. Now in all this madness, you'd think you'd get a VW Lupo because it's small, it's practical, it's cheap to insure and it does about a million miles to the gallon. But no, you get one of these to modify it, don't you Danny? To Come right. on, show us what you've got under the bonnet. No problem. A V6. How on earth do you get a V6 in a Lupo? Uh, quite a bit of engineering, but uh, patience and engineering at the end of the day will go in. And what, what possessed you, the thing that stunned me today is we've got Guys, with some with um, you know really old cars they're spending a fortune on, you know, things like this, completely cars that you just wouldn't associate with performance. What, why do you do it? Well, to start off with, nobody else has done it before, so it had to be done. Uh, the VR6 from Volkswagen is a brilliant engine to start off with. Got loads of power, loads of torque. But it's a loop. Yeah. You don't need loads of power and loads of torque. Yeah, you need power. Doesn't matter what car it is, you want a fast car, you build a fast car. So what sort of performance figures are we talking? We're talking uh, 0.60 between 6 and 6, six and a half seconds. 6 and a half seconds? Yes. Top, top speed? 150 miles an hour. That's, that's absolute madness. So how would you go on for things like insurance? I mean, uh, I'm on a trader's policy at the moment. But, uh, I've got quite so a few. So you're cheap? Yep. <laughs> yeah. quite, uh, quite a number of vehicles. Uh, I've got so Trent Sports is going to wait for me to go at the moment. How much work is involved in getting a, v, a V6? I mean, it, it's not a big car. Um, the company in question, they've put a V6 and other things before, like, like including Polos, and they said it was easier to do than a Polo. The Lupo is quite a wide car to start off with, and required very minimum chassis modifications. Yeah. So what else uh, What else has been done to the car apart from that, which is silly? Right. Sorry, but it's, Right. What, what else well, has been done? The basic engine's a rebuilt 2.9 Corrado VR6 unit. Uh, it's got gas flowed head, piper cams, uh, super chipped. Uh, it's got a full stainless steel exhaust with cat bypass on it. That's been took off. Uh, produced 220 brake horse. Oh, that's it. That's it. Uh, got modified suspension, um, FK, which is uh, coil over, adjustable. You can raise the car up and down, give a good ride high with it. Uh, the wheels, 9 by 16 wheels on it. I bet even getting 16 inch wheels on this car is a, is a bit of a feat. Yeah. <laughs> so what's what's next for you? Uh, turbo and six speed. You are insane. No. He's mad, huh? Cook, he's <laughs> mad. He's a nutter. Well, that's it for part one, but right after the break, we'll be looking at in car entertainment and Richard Hammond drives the Citroën Zara VTS. Now the centre of the NEC today has been given over to modified Citroen Saxos and once again the standard of the work that's gone into them is amazing. Now to give you an idea of just how popular the hot hack scene is, a quarter of all the Saxos that have been sold so far have been the performance VTS and VTR versions. But there is another Citroen with equally good performance and that's the Zara VTS. Ah, the heady days of youth, memories of your first car. Eventually you graduate to your first staggering attempt at personal transport until eventually the big day arrives, you're 17. You've got a motor. Then just as you're getting into the swing of it, you suddenly discover you're old and the trappings of youth are mercilessly taken away. 
But there is hope. There are some cars out there that allow you to retain just a little bit of your youthful vigour into your bland middle age. Good news if you're a boy or girl racer, because when it becomes time for you to graduate from your hot little Saxo VTS, there is hope in the form of something like this. The Citroen Zara, the car that neatly fills the gap between the youthful Saxo and the married with kids Xantia. Heaven forbid. Just because you've swapped your spots for a briefcase doesn't mean it has to be the end of your hot hatch fun. You can still have a laugh in a hot Citroen. The Zara VTS boasts pretty decent figures. It's a two litre engine, about 167 brake horsepower, top out at 137 miles an hour, and it'll dash from 0 to 60 in 7.9 seconds if you want to be precise. All perfectly respectable. If you like your cars curvy, then the lines of the Zara will be just the thing to get your pulse racing. And there's even a hint of the old Citroen DS. That's a very, very old Citroen if you're not over 50. It's a very firm, not jarring, but certainly sporting ride. The seats are very supportive. I'm gripped all around the side here in proper racing seat style. I do not understand the material, though. More at home on your granddad's cardio, I think, than on the seats of your almost hot hatch. If it's going to have the VTS badge and a hot Citroen, it's got to have that high revving 16 valve engine and it does in two litre form. It may be bigger, but it's still nimble. The power's still at the top end. It's still huge fun. Probably the best point and the most sporting point is that steering. It's instant. The car wakes up beautifully through the steering wheel. You can be very precise and a bit naughty. For what is a small hot car, it still manages to be quite sophisticated, which again will appear to a certain kind of hot hatch buyer. It's good to know as well that you're in a hot middle sized car that isn't a VW Golf GTI, it isn't an RS Turbo. It's something a little bit different, which is satisfying. So, you're a year or two older. Well, hey, we're all getting older. And never forget, you can take the boy out of his racer, but you'll never take the racer out of the boy. And maybe this is the car that can neatly plug that gap between the hot hatch of your youth and the MPV of your old Giffordham. And remember, there are advantages as well to having a boot that much bigger. More space for your toys. Now the modified car thing isn't just about body style and an engine tuning, a huge part of it is ice or in-car entertainment. Now Dell, this is basically your business isn't it, fitting car scenarios? Absolutely yeah, we've been doing it for the past 14 years and going anything from the sublime to the ridiculous really. Um, also it's really, it all depends on how much you want to spend. Now does it really make that much difference? Yeah, pretty much it does. You know, if you're going to spend peanuts, you're going to get nothing for it. You know, a long term, if you want to make it an investment, you've got to spend some real money. Now a lot of the cars I've seen down here have got like TVs, DVD players, is it really the, the sky's the limit? Absolutely, you can pretty much spend anything up to sort of really 45, 50 grand depending on how far you want to go. And what sort of cars have you, have you fitted out? I mean here obviously it's a lot of the high hatches, it's the, the sort of boy racer side, but do you do, do, you do the more mature buyers? Absolutely, we do all sorts of buyers that people are into classical music and things like that, but they want a really nice sounding overall system. So, you know, we do all sorts of people's cars. Anyone can get the bug as well. They get the bug and they want more and a nicer system, so. And do you find people, is it like a home life by where you can build it up gradually, or? Always, even more so. Yeah. We, uh, if, you, if you've done a job properly on an installation, basically, it's built to build on. And you get it built on it easier, and that's when they get the bug and it all escalates. Now, we've been trying to sort of film out here all day, and your van keeps stopping because of the, the base off it. I mean, what's that all about? 
Well, it's a 45,000 pound 22 kilowatt van that's the loudest van in the country by miles. It is so bloody loud. I mean, my ears are finished today. You know, we built it, it scares us even. So, why? <laughs> if you're going to do something big, you've got to do it properly. You know, and if you're going to make an impression on the market, you're going to make a demo van, you do it big. So, it's really sort of to see. See what you can do. It's basically to, to basically kill all the competition, just show people what we're capable of, and it works great. Now, again, a lot of money involved here. Who are the type of people that, that sort of buy your product? Because what I've been noticing and, and saying to a lot of people is there seems to be a lot of kids here with these fantastic cars, done a lot of work, and have spent a lot of money on it, and I don't really pay for it. Well, well, to be fair, kids live at home. They've got no outgoings. They go to their job. They get enthusiastic, they buy an ice, they buy a little car, body kit, the system's all part of it. It's all part of the integral package. You know, so it all goes together. And as, as you've got older, have you found your hearing sort of been getting worse? All day. I'm pretty much beat now. It's beat me. This band's beat me again. I go into it every weekend, all out, balls out, and now I'm, yeah, I'm done. You heard it first, death by sound system. <laughs> Now, to give you an idea what mounting to base does to your average escort van, well, your wiper blade shouldn't be doing this on the windscreen. And if your mobile phone does this on the roof, well, you know you've got a serious amount of noise going on in there. Well, that's just about it for Motor Week here at the NEC. And whether you like these cars or not, I think you'll agree, it has given us an insight into the amount of work, passion and energy that the guys put in in creating these vehicles. Now, just before I go, I'll tell you what's coming up on next week's Motor Week. Whether you're a fan of V8 supercars or lightweight racers, you'll love our head-to-head -head next week as we pitch the mighty V8 Lotus Esprit against the X-Siege. And what better place for such a test than at Lotus's very own test track at Norwich. So thanks for watching. And one last thing, before you start sawing parts of your car, get some advice from an adult. See you next week.